Hey everybody, welcome back to Fresh Out the Box as we sit down for an interview with Malcolm Shepard himself. Uh, I am the usual game master of Fresh Out the Box, Jahananan. I am your usual co-host at Fresh Out the Box, Casualty CDG. And I am Malcolm Shepard, and I'm the developer at large at Green Ramin, and I have done uh, writing and development uh, for tabletop role-playing games for... Uh, 22 years. Is that an easy yeah. is that an easy career to do for 22 years? It's just lush and and you may you like you drive a Lambo. You oh yeah, you just phone that in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, how has it would... been? How has the industry changed for you over over 22 years? You've you've been there to see it change quite a bit. Over 22 years. Okay, so uh, the first thing I will say is that. Um, when I got in, uh, basically, uh, collectible cards had just stepped on the throat of the rest of the games industry, with the exception of Warhammer. Um, and so when I started, like, you know, you would be, I would go into a general purpose game store and I would be lucky if, there was something other than, you know, a couple of dusty D&D books. And that changed a bit after 3rd edition came out, but not that much, right? It was more that, and now D&D is a thing again, and you can buy D&D, and maybe there are other games, who cares? Um, <laughs> right? And, but, you know, things sort of got better, and uh, uh, things sort of got better. I was initially hired by Jesse Hainick to work on a bunch of White Wolf projects. And then I, uh, and then I transitioned with the company into what was then the new world of darkness. Um, that ended up being terrible goddamn fucking timing because <laughs> and I the world of darkness was announced in 2003. Um, and then the book started being released in 2000, uh, 2004, 2005, 2006. Well, between the announcement and the release, um, the industry collapsed. Um, that is, that there was a bubble in tabletop role playing created by D20 products, um, third party D20 products supporting Dungeons and Dragons. And then 3.5 came out. And even though most third edition things were compatible with 3.5, uh, retailers didn't want to take, you know, obsolete d20 products in um there were also a couple of companies that went under and it was just a big huge goddamn disaster um and so during that period um you know i was getting more and more freelance work um and then i started and i started working i was involved with designing new world of darkness stuff um the successor to Mage the Ascension, now Mage the Awakening, was was fun because that went through like three, like there are three totally different versions of that game that were produced almost in full, right? Um, as, you know, as the creative forces moved back and forth. And, you know, White Wolf was pushing really hard to turn their stuff into a big multimedia property and it was designed from the ground up for that. Um, except, of course, that the stuff they actually released, they released after the bubble burst. Um, and despite the fact that initial sales were extremely good, right, there were problems sustaining it because there were problems with people getting into games at all. And then, you know, um, they had always wanted to do more games, uh, more electronic games. And then what happened is they essentially got acquired by CCP. Um, and then through that period, you know, it was hard to it was hard for me to get work. Um, I did work for a couple of other companies in that time, like some small D twenty outfits. And oh, I did a book for Shadowrun. That was my one and only book for Shadowrun. Nice. And that was um, well, I didn't do other ones um, for because at the time there was a situation that it would be prudent for me not to describe, but you can look up that situation with Catalyst Game Labs on the internet. <laughs> um, 
<clears throat> I see Jahan. He did, however, involve them at one point, sending me a letter saying, we can't tell if we owe you any money. Tell us if we owe you money and we'll send you some. Um, but fortunately, um, I had already been paid at the time. And, and I tried to be honest. So, so I was fine. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so from that point forward, really, like, um, I had also been working in nonprofit, um, doing adult education and community education, and working with adults, um, usually in crisis um, or coming out of crisis, and here trying to pick up new skills. And uh, so that was the focus of my career, uh, really. And games were sort of also there. Um, and then. Um, well, then nonprofit dried up where I was. Um, and so I started to look at games a little more seriously um, as as my was not just half of my career, but my my career, because I think I had at one point really been thinking, you know, it's time to grow up and get into NPOs is my real job. But, you know, fortunately, that was not to be. Um, God. Then there was one point, I think at one point, like where all of my income came from tabletop, I think there was one year where like my income was like $6,000 Canadian. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the starving artist drive in the tabletop industry is real. And yeah. if you are a creator, it's a great time to be a creator. But know that the starving artist drive is real. Your first book, I don't think, is going to be your multi-million dollar retire on it book. Um, I think you're going to have to write a whole lot if you're if you want to be a tabletop game designer, creator, writer. Uh, it's it's not like being a movie star, is it? You... Yeah. Um, yeah. It's. I think there's a big discussion about this right now because Paizo recently unionized, which is super cool. Very cool. Um, but there's always a thing where, you know, people could stand to be paid better. Absolutely. Certainly. Definitely. Sometimes the examples we get are not realistic in that someone will say they made this enormous rate. And then you will learn that it came from a big Kickstarter hit. Right. Um, and certainly very few companies can go, you know, we'll just make we'll make six digits out of this Kickstarter and that's our business plan and we can project for that. It doesn't happen to everybody. So that's part of it. Um, and then sometimes it turns out that it's not very many words and it doesn't come that often, right? So if I make 20 cents a word, but it's 5,000 words and I don't see another 5,000 words for three months, then, you know, it's not great for me, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, instead, I think uh, there has to be this sort of, there has to be a kind of global change where, well, I'm sorry to say it, the book prices go up. They need to go up um, along with the compensation. The trouble in terms of getting that being a thing is, um, well, there are, certain legal barriers that prevent businesses from doing this thing that is sometimes called polluting right. to increase prices. <laughs> yeah, right. all their book prices up at once, they, <laughs> so, they get investigated for collusion. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But there's, there's absolutely something to be said about the price of a tabletop role-playing game book. When you split it between the four or five people who will be playing it, you're talking about $10 a person, or if you imp increase the price of the book, still no more than $20 a person. That is, if you guys are playing the game twice, if you play it three times, now you've like triple covered the price of a movie or dinner or going out. It's such an inexpensive hobby if you can convince your friends to help you buy the product. If, if you're the one who's buying $60 book after $60 book and you don't have a table, it's an expensive hobby. But if you just get your friends to chip in, it's not that hard. Everyone's got 10 or 15 bucks laying around, and that makes it a lot more affordable. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I think that's one of the reasons that 
it, you know, it, a lot of economic shocks don't affect us the way they affect other industries and other forms of entertainment. This time around has been an exception. Um, and that's because, you know, people can't go into stores. They are, you know, for years, you know, for years, people have been restricted from physically entering a store. And that's for excellent reasons. It's so they don't get sick and they don't get other people sick and people don't die. And I'm all for it. But the fact remains that, you know, no going to, you know, almost, you know, a few opportunities to go to conventions, a few opportunities to buy books, a um, few opportunities to meet around a table with people. Yeah. Right. Um, my own group, um, we have been socially distanced since um, March 2020. And I have not been. Um, I have not been closer, ex except for one person who is in my COVID circle, um, in Ontario, you know, we have this, you know, you can have a group of people who kind of are together for that purpose. Right. Um, yeah, there's one, I game, one of the people I game with is in my COVID circle. The other ones, um, I, you know, I, every once in a while I am within six feet of them. Right. So obviously that is a huge, has a huge negative effect on things. And plus, of course, you know, um, international printing and distribution. Right now, distribution is a huge thing, um, which makes me want to say as an aside, uh, I know we're not in the uh, segment where I plug my book, but it was printed in Europe. Um, and part of the reason is uh, is so that it will arrive in a timely fashion. Um, but, you know, with the supply chain crisis on top of making it difficult to do the basic things people need to do to buy and play games, it's been hugely challenging. So I'm really interested to see, you know, where things will go from here, especially now that there's a general awareness um, that there need to be changes um in work and how people work and then how they get compensated uh i think there's the opportunity for some really great things to happen uh on the labor side of games and in labor generally and and i hope rpgs are part of that um but too soon to tell because again the prices need to go up and everybody is you first and right? with the way this is tipping uh, with paizo accepting or, or acknowledging rather, it, it looks like this could spread through the video game industry as well. It looks like this this really could be a tipping point for the game industry on all sides to, to really take care of its, you know, that's what we're all hoping anyways. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, is that um, when it comes to electronic games, like when I, I interviewed, I interviewed for one company and they said, well, no, we're, you know, we're, we believe in work-life balance. Uh, we limit crunch time to 14 hours a day, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right? And what I really feel, though, for is for, you know, folks who are coming out of school, you know, in electronic things, coming out of school, maybe they've done some indie titles and stuff, and they see this opportunity, and they, you go to, you know, company I won't name's office, and it looks great. There's a gym there and, you know, com big comfy couches. And there's a chef who makes you free food. And, and it that's... certainly seems better than no job at all when you're that age yeah. and you want to get it, into game development. It seems like luxury. There's all this stuff that you get and you have this high prestige job. But all of that stuff exists for the situations in which you cannot physically leave the office for extended periods of time. Yeah. Those comfy couches are for sleeping on. That chef is to make you food. It's a prison. So that, yeah, it, because it's <laughs> it's prison. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's a prison thought, cook. I always thought, wouldn't it be nice if instead of these comfy fucking couches and these chefs, wouldn't it be nice if they just gave us that money instead? Wouldn't it be cool if they just paid their employees instead, <laughs> instead of yeah. tr providing yeah. all of this yeah. bullshit that nobody wants? Just let me go home. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that's the thing. I mean, it's, it's, and, and I think we're seeing too that like, you know, 
we're not getting better, like in the electronic games industry, like certainly better games aren't coming because people are working their butts off, right? Um, and, you know, when you look at something like Cyberpunk, right? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, you know, the game that's been out for months but is actually coming out next year at this point, right? Um, and they said they would limit crunch, but then they didn't, right? And certainly the crunch didn't seem to have made it much of a difference in the final product, right? And I would have been happy with them biding their tongue. Yeah. Um, we're definitely... you, know, you don't really have that kind of thing. I saw a tweet the other day um, from someone who was told that they were pressured to finish their work earlier than the contract stipulated. Ooh. And that was quite a surprise for me. Like, certainly, one, companies don't do that, right? Um, deadline is a deadline uh, when it's written on paper or negotiated through email. Um, but the funny thing for me is that I have almost never seen that scenario as a writer or developer where, you know, give me that thing faster. Generally, when I have handed in things earlier on time, it has been confusing to the person <laughs> I have handed it into. What is this and why do I need to look at it? Well, it's, you know, I know it's a week early, but here's my portion of the book. <laughs> Sometimes I've been asked to, like, send it to them again on the <laughs> deadline so they don't lose it right now send it next thursday when i'm ready for it yeah, yeah that's funny i have gotten situations where like you know people have been you know uh thought you know they've asked me if the deadline was that day um or they told me to wait because you know everybody else is gonna everybody else is gonna ha hand it on the next bumper weekday right on the monday or the friday so you may as well do it then right um but sometimes it is usually the problem is is that it's hard for people to meet deadlines um and usually that is nowadays honestly because people have too much stuff going on right um, I'm wondering if that's good advice for a new creator is to set a deadline for yourself so that you don't keep pushing your own work back um because that's kind of a thing i've uh, Jahan and i have been working on a game now and we know what we want and we put pen to paper, but it seems like we just haven't been able to finish it yet. And I, I think that there's something good to be said about deadlines and helping you push a focus and, and really get your idea out there, outlined and ready to go. Well, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, maybe, deadlining is huge. Maybe if we, uh, uh, you could tell us about your work process. Where, where do you right. start uh, that kind of thing? Where do I start that kind of thing? Well, um, there is a game that I am doing some stuff for now. And basically, the first thing I do is I consume media related to what that thing is for two reasons. The first is to get ideas. The first is to specifically reject ideas that I think have been overused or common or would come off as imitative, right? Um, so within the genre I'm working in, you know, there's a lot of chosen one narratives, so I want to not deal with those. Um, uh, at Green Ronin, often uh, they'll start with a pitch, right? And basically you see if the um, the people in charge like the pitch and you see if the people you work with like the pitch and if so that means there's some potential and maybe it'll go on the schedule um and when you're doing that pitch is that uh is that a pitch for like a campaign adventure design or is that just for a system design or either or, or anything everything you know if i'm just doing something for myself right a pitch is still useful because you have to present the most accessible ideas now, some people believe in doing an elevator pitch and stuff like that, but I think that's too constraining, right? Like, and also, you know, I just, I don't feel like appealing to people who need things explained to them in a few yeah. short sentences or they're done, right? Yeah, like, have some fucking one sentence, then I'm not fucking talking to you. Yeah, apply, <laughs> apply your fucking attention span. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't have to do things that everybody will want. Um, and so that's, 
you know, that's my interest, right? I want people to dig in, right? Like threefold is like that. I, I want I want a threefold to feel like it has been around for 20 fucking years, right? Um, so the first thing I do is, you know, I do the pitch and then, you know, I get some feet, I get some eyes on it. And then after I get a critical number of eyes on it, I don't have people look anymore because there is a point where like, you know, the too many cooks thing or everybody wants to be helpful, but eventually they are kind of helping to help and not because they see something that needs to be addressed. So after that, I go back and I break it out into an outline. And that is generally by chapter and section. Um, often one of the great things to do that is, you know, a handy thing when you are working for a company is that you can get access to other outlines. Uh, <laughs> so I haven't one to work all the time. That's an old trick for the state. Also, you just go back, copy an old report, <laughs> copy yeah. the new report in, change some of the names and dates. And I generally like to break things down to the point where I immediately know, or I'm close to immediately knowing what I would write in that subsection. Um, not everything. But like just thinking, oh, for the first bit, I'll do that. That is enough of an impulse for me to get going. Um, I generally will outline word count goal or targets by chapter. Um, if I'm working with other writers, then yeah, it's going to break down by section. And if a section is particularly tricky, I will have a note for what I think the word count should be. Um, because not because it'll be so hard to reach those words. I want to have a target, but often because I know that I will just go on and on unless I am told the st that I would promise to stop. <laughs> 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 um, and then once you have, once the writing on each section, each chapter and each section is the tip of your tongue, then you pound out the goddamn words. And I cannot, this is the thing that is getting me with a lot of the uh, discourse, um, is that writing at length is a skill that you need to develop. Um, and that is writing good words quickly um, at a regular pace, right? There are some people out there who put things off and off. They like basically, they learned the habit of putting things off until the last minute at, you know, in college or whatever, right? And then, you know, and then they're handed a 10,000 word assignment and they're fucking lost because, yeah, it is possible to do 10,000 words in one day. I've done it. Um, but it's not an everyday thing, right? It exhausts you, right? I think, I think at one point I did nearly 20,000 words in two days and I was fucking useless after that. Um, now, there are some people who are like really, you know, you know, who can touch type, for example, uh, <laughs> who have a faster pace than me. Um, I generally schedule things for freelancers um, at a, a, with a, at a rate of 10,000 words a month, assuming. And but 10,000 words a month isn't assuming that I'm the only thing they're working on. That's assuming that they have a life. <laughs> right and so you know generally uh, the deadline first draft deadlines i will set are based on you know who has the longest section and it's a month for every ten thousand words with some wiggle room back and forth depending on the prevailing dates and holidays and things like that right planning it for myself i would probably maybe double that however that is still short of my actual rate um, I typically write two to three thousand words a day when I'm on, um, and two thousand is probably a reasonable goal for anyone who wants to do this kind of work, um, right? Now, those two thousand words aren't necessarily going to take you eight hours, right? Um, but generally, they're all the decent words you have time for, right? Because certainly anybody can write garbage after that, right? You know, like <laughs> I can, I can. You know, the, yesterday I did like uh, 2,100 words over three and a half hours. And then I 
talked about my anticipation for seeing Dune and a bunch of crap that I learned because I science fiction was in one of my concentrations in university. Um, and then I bored people on Facebook with that for like a thousand words or so. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had plenty of energy for that mental trash. Right. Um, but for structured writing, I think 2000, 2000 is a good work day. Um, all right. And 500 an hour is not a bad place. Right. And that includes doing interstitial research. One of the things where we are so blessed to, to have the internet because it means that we don't have to not know things most of the time yes you get to you're you get to be very dumb when you have the internet because <laughs> you don't have to retain information anymore well that's and the thing it, gone is the day of having to go to a library to research it to bring the book home to read it to figure it out because now you can just control f on a page and find the thing you're looking for yes but the blessing is is if you do writing then you immediately have to apply that knowledge and then it becomes ingrained because it's like you're taking notes. Um, yeah. Like when we, I did the, uh, with Steve Kenson, um, we did an age adaptation of Trojan War, which is the uh, old uh, D20 book. We did a fantasy age adaptation of it. Uh, just a short little thing. But one of the reasons it's a short little thing is because I don't have to explain the Trojan War in detail. Like, no. even the obscure bits can be found online. So that shrunk the book considerably. And we just noted that in the book. Like, listen, this is smaller because go look it up. But it also meant that a lot of things in the original I was able to update because the original was in the early 2000s and, you know, pre-Wikipedia explosion, um, pre-the establishment of so many academic websites. So, you know, I was able to get into things like, you know, um, the Trojan War happened before coins were invented, right? <laughs> so that's a big deal when you have currency in your game, right? Um, and also, you know, there's a bit of discussion about, well, these are the archaeological artifacts that kind of suggest what people were wearing and what weapons they used at the time. However, and this is the great thing about something like, you know, about being able to, like, you know, fall into a Wikipedia hole while you're writing, is, uh, is well, yes, that's all true. You know, the Achaeans wore lots of weird stuff. Like, they wore, like, helmets with antennas and stuff like that, right? And actually, no, they're spears. I was thinking of their spears. They have this spearhead that looks like a, like a crab claw. It's really funky. <laughs> Um, and this Michelin man bronze armor. <laughs> <laughs> but but here's the thing. Um, I'll, I also noted that it is perfectly in keeping with tradition to just change it to whatever whatever you think looks cool because that's what people did with the actual Trojan War throughout history. And not just in like later Greek stuff. When during the time in the Middle Ages... In the Middle Ages, the Iliad was actually kind of an obscure text, but people were aware of the Trojan War and stories around it. And they were particularly aware of these battles between Achilles and Heracles and the Amazons. And when they portrayed them, they portrayed them in like 14th century armor, jousting, right? <laughs> so you have Achilles jousting in steel armor, and that's how they showed it. And that's perfectly cool. And you can do it that way in your game. And that, it was so that was, cool to that look that up. Romeo Juliet to West Side Story back then. They just updated it for the crowd. Yeah, yeah. So fantastic, just fantastic. And it was so good to be able to find that and go like, yeah, it's super traditional to where, you know, to ha say that your character has, you know, one of those uh, Corinthian help. Right? Yeah, that's fine. That's totally keeping the way way the Trojan War works in Legend. Mm -hmm. so, you keep the feel, and that's what's important. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm, I hate to cut our time short, but I gotta ask you one, maybe Jahan has a final question also, but I have one final question. Are there any games coming out, tabletop games or board games, that you're excited for, looking forward to playing? 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, any tabletop games that are coming out that I'm looking forward to playing? That's a good question, and I am not sure of the answer. Um, part of it is because there are so many games I want to catch up on that I have. There are so many games that I've always wanted to get back to. Like, in the, in my near future, I'm playing a bard in this 5th edition game, and that has me excited. I haven't played 5th edition in a while. Um, and so I guess that's it, for one. Um, but I also am really interested in looking back through some of the older games in my collection. One of the ones that I've always wanted to run again, and this is going to seem weird is the first edition of the palladium fantasy role-playing game it is this weird early 80s D, D variant artifact um it has a lot of things in it that are terrible um <laughs> however i find it extremely inspiring on a number of levels too because um because of the how naive the system is um, like it uses, like, I don't know if you've ever experienced the Palladium system, right? But in the Palladium system, everything you do requires a die roll in combat. Nothing is abstracted. So if you dodge a blow, you roll a dodge each and every time, right? And I find the idea of that, of there being perfect one-to-one -one parity between, um, player action and character action, really fascinating. And I want to torture myself by playing this <laughs> game that does not have great rules, just to explore that one aspect of it. Um, <laughs> and That's good. aside from that, I don't know what's you know what what's coming out. Ah, oh, there's so much coming out. Well, uh, you tell me about it. The there's brand so new much. games, uh, Dune just came out. Uh, there's an Avatar oh, yeah. game oh. coming out. That's what I was going to say. Avatar, oh, Avatar? Yeah. Avatar tabletop role-playing game, The Last yeah. Airbender, has everybody pretty excited. And there is also... Uh, like, literally a thousand others. But let's see. What, yeah. what uh, else? Wild, Wild Sea Wild is an indie game. And that one I'm really excited for. It's, it's Wild called sea. Wild Sea. And it's, it's a small indie game. Their Kickstarter was last year. And I think they ship here in the next two months... But the setting is, uh, like, ironwood trees have just exploded up and taken over the entire planet of Earth, like, 2,000 years ago. And oh, so, look at this. All right, that looks amazing. So <laughs> you and your crew are on, like, saw-powered ships sailing across the top of these ironwood trees, and the closer you get to the forest floor, the more dangerous things get. There are giant colossal monsters down there, forgotten ruins of the old Earth and the old world that was. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm sold. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. Um, yeah, that's one we've really, we're just on the edge of our seat. Like, please yeah. ship. So please, please, we want to play this. I do want to get in, I do want to get into Doom, though, at some point. I just want to, um, I haven't had a chance to get it in hard copy, and I kind of want to wait till I do that. Um, so it is a really, really cool, big, beautiful book full of art. And so getting yeah. the hard copy is, I, I would say, for sure, grab the hard yeah, copy. Definitely a collector's can. piece. Yeah, it's a nice book. Yeah. Uh, I'm so... not a huge fan of Powered by the Apocalypse, so huh. um, not so much on the Avatar. I like the series, though. Um, I'll tell you one funny thing about Powered by the Apocalypse, though, is that I there are a lot of things I do like about it. Um, and one of the things that I... I like is um, I often describe it as you know Powered by the Apocalypse games run like the D and D episode of Community. Have you ever seen the D and D episode of Community? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, very much so. Don't they run like the D and D episode of the Community of Community where Abed just says, "Tell me what you're going to do," mm -hmm. right? And I'll figure out. Well, I mentioned this as an aside in this group, in this in this games group on Facebook, and someone said, "Well, what do you mean? Like what?" It's the thing where you engage with the fiction directly, and then that triggers the move. And they were like, there were these people, they were very vocal fans of Powered by the Apocalypse <laughs> games. Like, don't get me wrong, these are people who talked about their Dungeon World games and Apocalypse World games and their homebrews and everything. 
half of them had no idea what I was talking about. And it blew me away. And here I thought you were going to say that their realities were shattered when they realized it, but they just didn't understand the concept you were trying to explain. No, they, they just, it wasn't, they just didn't, how could you not have that as the takeaway? <laughs> <laughs> the instructions are very explicit. I'm a, I'm how a, is the thing that makes it something other than, you know, flip a cook? It's kind of what makes it what it is, yeah. I think I'm a huge fan of the Powered by the Apocalypse system, but right now I've, I've literally only played one game. I played City of Mist, and I really, really enjoyed City of Mist. The Avatar game Jahan and I took a look at, and I wasn't as stoked for that game as, as much as I had loved what City of Mist was. And so I guess I have to hold my reservations how I feel about Powered by the Apocalypse until I play more than just City of Mist, which, again, I love. A million times over. Same. Well, it's a very customizable system, right? And I think it's one of the reasons why it's such a blessing for new designers, right? And experienced ones too. Um, I uh, there's so many good bits of games, aren't there? Like that's the thing that gets me. Like I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of Fate, except I think aspects are completely genius, right? And here, Fate. We just talked about Fate on Sunday. We were on another podcast. And I told them that Fate for me was life-changing when I played it. I never wanted to play Dungeons & Dragons again uh, when I woke up the next day. I was so mesmerized and blown away by just storytelling as, as a thing that you could do and cutting out so much of the in-between stuff. So I've, I had never played a game like that before. I am a big, I'm a big fan of Gumshoe. Um, and that, yeah, those are some games I'd love to play. Like that is, that that's definitely my like, you know. Those are the games that I definitely like. Really want to get people into. Like I, I went all in on Knights Black Agents. Oh, I love that game, right? Vampire Espionage. Hmm. Right. They even have like a version. Like I even bought their copy of the book Dracula, that is customized to be, you know. To be a piece of evidence, um, right? <laughs> uh, to go along with the Dracula dossier campaign, and ah, uh, like it's operating at like they're operating at such a high level, Pelgrain, with some of the stuff they do, and I'm so jealous. <laughs> um, earlier, I was talking about the Yellow King, and that has got to be everything about it is fantastic. Even the presentation uh, is four books that come in a box, and the box unfolds into two GM screens magnetically. That's um, <laughs> it's got these four tiny classy hardcovers, and it explores. Basically, it uses the it uses the Yellow King um, from you know the Chambers King and Yellow and stuff, but without the Cthulhu mythos. So it's only focused on that, and it relays this bizarre alternate history of a totalitarian America with these like corrupting alien technologies um, going through a strange and terrible world war and then going through a revolution against the regime controlling America um, through these three books so it has this epic campaign arc and then it takes you into the modern day where that epic that if you went through it straight you just played parts of it start to bleed into the real world. Um, oh, interesting. Oh, it's it's amazing. And uh, and some of the things, like it has like, it has a bunch of like ways you can kind of add prompts about the alienness, right? Like, you know, um, for example, like one of them is like, you know, at some point your characters may have questions about the suicide machines. <laughs> right, <laughs> which is an element of the setting, right? Um, and it goes through like you know, well, this is a world in which there are suicide machines, and here are the social issues around suicide machines. Um, but you know, when you're talking about taking that one detail, right? This is that one detail. It's that one strange detail, and it completely throws you off uh, the way Robin Wells presents it. Um, and Gumshoe is such a, and Gumshoe is a system that gets straight to the point for what it wants to do, too, right? Um, it doesn't add more systems than it needs, and I I love it. I just love it. 
Very interesting. Yeah, I also it's not current. I got it a couple of years ago, but mm, so good. I'm writing so down good. all the games you keep mentioning. I'm looking at them as you're talking. About them. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I guess uh, my last question uh, before we go would be. Uh, what advice would you have for, uh, you know, TTRPG fans in general or uh, people that want to develop? Oh, people who want to do game development? Um, well, uh, do a lot of writing for a lot of different people. I think one of my flaws is that I spent most of my time with one company. Go to conventions. That's something that slowed me down for a long time. Um, is I went to Gen Con in like 2003, and then I went to a bunch of, uh, and I was a fixture at a local convention that wasn't really a game convention, well, a game convention, well, and I went to some small conventions, but you have to, I would say the life cycle for a game professional these days is one, self-publish, um, two, uh based on that self-publishing um you know get your pitches in um while developing your stamina as a writer so that you can do the word counts required i cannot emphasize how important it is to be able to write at length with quality um it is a skill you're capable of developing it it just takes time um so you pick up those freelance credits um, or, you know, whatever, you know, you may want to still keep working on your own or both. Um, yes, I, have and, a, I have a like a interjection question. How mm -hmm. do you convention? How to a convention? You go to a convention uh, for someone who doesn't know what to do. It can be overwhelming. There's a lot of booths, a lot of tables. You've self-published your first game. You go to a convention. Uh, What's your, I, I think your goal there is to network, right? And meet everybody. Yeah. Well, there are events for that. So you want to be mindful of those. I would say the number one thing at a convention, honestly, has nothing to do with the business side. Schedule a self to play some games, for God's sake. <laughs> right? Um, like, make sure, uh, and panels. Like, give yourself things to do. Because otherwise, you'll be standing around, sitting around a lot. And it'll be demoralizing. Um, I guess the other thing is to talk to only to people who are interested and genuinely interested in talking to you. And um, people often act like this is a closed, scary community, but let's just say, let's just say that, you know, not a lot of us were on sports teams. <laughs> uh, uh, not a lot of us were on sports teams and enjoying like, uh, an, ex an, ex an excess of riches in our social lives. So really, people are pretty friendly. But they don't want to feel like they're being used or manipulated or anything like that. So, you know, we're all interested in games. Like, only only a small number of fucking assholes are completely mercenary and jaded about the whole thing, yeah. right? The rest of us are wandering around looking in people's booths, looking, oh, what's that cool thing? Can I afford it? right we're not remote at all right and uh the uh <laughs> you know like that's how i found mothership right there's a game there's a great game mothership oh ah. um mothership i'm just wandering awesome. around and i'm like what the hell is this i want this oh and i get oh those zines are cheap like god like i wanted to get, i wanted to get to know these guys and really like the barrier on that side was that they were too busy <laughs> uh, otherwise i would trade cards with them and and do all that stuff yeah yeah hell yeah if i ever get right? a hold of them i'll i'll tell them about you because uh, i've been yeah. trying to message them too uh to get content for our channel and uh if that ever happens i'll i'll be like hey malcolm oh, yeah, this please is do. High. um please do that was super cool uh, and uh yeah Basically, you know, if you're enthusiastic about your stuff and you're enthusiastic about other people's stuff, because you have to be giving. Because, of course, one of the things that we encounter at conventions is just like people who have come to let you know that they're smarter than you. Right? <laughs> like, you know, they'll come to your booth and they'll talk to you about some like little weird rules thing that they consider a flaw. Right. And whether it's a flaw or not, like, I don't, 
I will come to your place <laughs> and tell you how you could have done a better job unless I have something in my hand that needs fixing that's under warranty or something, right? <laughs> like, fuck off. Um, <laughs> like, you know, be enthusiastic and we'll be enthusiastic back, right? Like, and, like a lot of the time, I can't really continue. Okay, so this one time... Um, the funny thing, I, uh, I'm at the Green Ronin booth, and this guy walks in, and he's this fellow Jake Norwood. Now, Jake Norwood is two things. He designed a game in the early 2000s called The Riddle of Steel, which is like the ancestor of modern, heavy, heavy sim uh, medieval fantasy games. The other thing is that he is one of the most prominent historical fencers in North America, right? So I'm seeing, I'm like, oh, it's that guy! Uh, <laughs> Knows who that guy is except for you, and you're like, it's, it's fucking it's that, that guy. guy! Right, and he's wearing a long point, like long point is the tournament that he does, and he's wearing his long point shirt. And like, yeah, you take notes, like, I am. And I... And I played it cool, and I said, well, I see. Well, I'm, in, I'm, I'm also into historical fencing, and I like your game a little steel and blah, blah, blah. And I came off like a, like a fucking dork. Because <laughs> it seemed, and not like a dork in that I talked too much, a dork in that I talked too little. Because I seemed like, you know, some know-it-all guy who wanted to prove how smart he was, right? When instead, I should have went, I love the riddle of steel. Um, I I know games aren't your thing now, but I sure as hell wonder what the hell you would do nowadays if you had it. It's so much fun to look through it. Thanks for making that. Right? That's the thing to do. Are you fucking kidding? People <laughs> love be, like be like let's be amazed at each other's work. Um, and you know, don't be afraid to talk about your own stuff in the same tone. Like, you know, no one to quit, right? Um, wait for the response. But, you know, go and meet people. Be enthusiastic about your stuff. Be enthusiastic about their stuff. And find things in common to talk about um, from that point forward. So, you know, and you never know when it's going to happen. I mean, I, um, I ran into this fellow, James Wallace, because he didn't have any American money. So I got him a cab in, right? And we had a great conversation, right? James Wallace uh, ran Hogshead Games. They had Warhammer Fantasy for a long time. And now he does games consultancy. So I met him that way, right? Just just that way. Just by being happy to meet some. Right? And if pe and of course there are gonna be people who are jackasses and well, you're better off not working with them. Yeah. <laughs> Like, maybe give them another chance. Maybe give them two chances. Because generally, you never know when you meet someone on their off day, right? Someone has a bad day, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's all on their journey through life, and they're all at different points. So yeah, you might have met them on a jackass day. Yeah, you know what I find as I have gotten older? I've come to realize that for most of my life, I vastly underestimated how much physical things affected my mood. Right, I, I like how things like, you know, oh, you're acting like this because you're hungry. Right, <laughs> I did not have the basic fucking self awareness to uh, re to comprehend angriness until my forties. So don't be like that. I, <laughs> Take care of, of yourself. First, first things we worked on, and and we we're talking earlier about therapy. It's one of the first things we worked on was uh, I I did not have the self awareness of my emotions, and so it was something so simple as the therapist saying. Uh, figure out what emotion you're feeling by trying to rate it one through ten. Oh and yeah. So yeah, whenever yeah. I was feeling away, it was like, "What way are you feeling?" Rate it one through ten, and I was like, "Well, I know that I'm feeling a seven, but what the fuck seven am I feeling?" And so that way, I started to become more aware of what my human emotions were. Oh yeah, my yeah. thing was always like, "No, I don't want to. I don't want to state how I feel simply." <laughs> I want to go through an elaborate rationalization how, you know, having these extremely not good ways of acting just makes sense because I've devised a perfect argument for it. And I'm going to bore you with this argument, therapist. And 
yeah, I am sad, but I don't see how that enters into it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but some some really great advice from uh, game creator Malcolm Shepard from Green Ronin. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say uh, before we go tonight? I have had a fantastic time this evening, so thank you very much for having me. Um, I hope Sorry. we can do this or something again or a game or something soon. Definitely. Um, and, you know, let me know what conventions you go to uh, once that becomes a thing, if that's a thing you're doing. And, uh, and I guess I want people to just be open to the fact that they can have fun and that it's meaningful for them to do it because it is the most rewarding thing. Not just in games, but, you know, anything you do to know that like something you said or done has brought joy to someone without you having to be there and make it happen. And it is, and it makes you, it makes you feel better about yourself and it makes you feel like you don't have to keep reaching or proving when people are on their own doing their thing and they're having fun. And thank you for demonstrating that with the games you play and for talking to me. Um, it's it's meaningful. Thank you. Yeah, no, always a pleasure having you. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. Uh, we've been fresh out the box. Uh, have a great night.